This is DW News, live from Berlin. Vladimir Putin wins Russia's presidential election by a landslide. State-run exit polls show him receiving 88% of the vote, but foreign governments insist the vote is neither free nor fair because Putin has imprisoned political opponents and prevented others from running against him. Germany's chancellor goes to the Middle East to push for a ceasefire in Gaza. Olaf Scholz tells his Israeli counterpart that lasting security for Israel lies in a two-state solution. He urges more humanitarian aid to reach Palestinian civilians. I'm Ben Fazulan. Welcome. Exit polls and early results show Vladimir Putin is on course for a landslide victory in Russia's presidential election. The exit polls show him receiving nearly 88% of the vote. But governments around the world say the election was not free or fair, given the absence of any real political opponents. Putin has been in power since 1999, and this win will extend his presidency by another six years. DW is following developments in Russia from Riga, where DW's Moscow bureau relocated after being forced to shut down operations in Russia. I asked reporter Sergei Satanovsky to tell us more about the numbers and early reaction. Well, this is right, Ben. Putin is winning with around 87 or 88 percent. This is according to the exit polls from the Russian state-owned uh, polling organization Tsiom, but the Central Election Commission has announced the, sa has announced the same number after processing 30 percent of the ballots. I must say that this is a huge number even, uh, for, for Putin, even compared to his previous results in previous elections. And it's no surprise that the highest numbers are coming from the occupied territories of Ukraine, Donetsk, Luhansk and uh, uh, Kherson regions. However, uh, I should also say that Putin's landslide victory is not the only reason why this election uh, will be remembered. It's also the massive crowds of uh, people who came to the polling station uh, stations to protest against Putin, against the war. And uh, in this sense, uh, we can say that the Russian opposition's campaign noon against Putin can be considered successful, and also the representatives of Alexei Navalny's team, uh, the opposition leader who died a month ago in a penal colony in Siberia, have already declared its success. DW Sergei Sadanovsky reporting from Riga on the Russian elections. Thank you. Thousands lined up at the Russian embassy here in Berlin, many to cast their ballots as a protest against Russia's presidential election. Yulia Navalnyaya, the widow of the late Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny, joined thousands who backed her call for a noon rally against Vladimir Putin. There were concerns she may be arrested upon entering the Russian embassy. She was escorted out by German police after casting her vote. Matthew Murray is a Russia expert and professor at Columbia University in New York. He knew Alexei Navalny. I asked him what Navalny stood for. I think the most important uh, characteristic of Alexei Navalny was that he was a man of faith and that he had uh, an absolute belief that if Russians would exercise free will and courage, that Russia could be a modern, stable and peaceful democracy tomorrow. And this noon against Putin protest today is an example of the gift, the type of gift that his vision and his faith gave to the Russian people. And I was very encouraged to see as the, the number of people that decided to engage in this rather ingenious form of protest. And I think it's important for your viewers to know that, um, you know, it is illegal in Russia to express your opinions freely, to organize and to demonstrate. And so Alexei Navalny, before he was killed by the Putin regime, created this form of protest in which uh, voters could go and register their, their concerns about the Putin regime mm. by standing in line all at the same time. And I think it was successful. I would agree with 
the assessment of your of your um, correspondent. So successful in changing the narrative of, of this election? Successful in giving people a sense of empowerment. That is something that um, Alexei was determined to do, was to help um, individual Russians understand that it was within their power to change the course of their country's history. And from the reports that I've read this morning and just listening to your broadcast, it's clear that many individuals went there today to say no to Putin, to say yes to peace in Ukraine, and to state their desire to have a, a free Russia in the future. And of course, this is modest and, and symbolic. It's not going to change the election outcome. But it will um, change the narrative, as you've indicated, by helping um, spread the idea that, um, th that of hope that uh, not Navalny and his and his wife Yulia stand for. Uh, it doesn't change the fact, though, that this was a landslide victory for Putin. Where does that leave him? Well, it, you know, what it does is it underscores the, whether, in fact, Putin is legitimate as a ruler of Russia. Mm -hmm. Um, the you know the it's one thing to be elected. It's another thing to govern with legitimacy, with authority, with a with a kind of moral uh, authority behind what you're doing. And um, it is clear to many in the world and to many Russians that Putin's regime is no longer legitimate, that it is based on fear, repression, and now just outright cr cruelty cruelty to, obviously, to the people of Ukraine, but also cruelty to his own people. And so um, the question is how um, sustainable that may be um, as a form of, uh, you know, managing and, and running a society such as Russia. Interesting insights from Matthew Murray uh, from Columbia University. Many thanks. Thank you. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has met with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in Jerusalem amid growing bilateral tensions over Israel's war against Hamas. Netanyahu reiterated Israel's focus on eliminating the Palestinian militant group. His plan includes an offensive into Rafah in the Strip, where more than a million displaced Palestinians are sheltering. Schultz said Israel's security is essential, but that there must be a long-term peace solution that includes Palestinian governance in Gaza and the West Bank. Schultz also called for more aid to reach Palestinian civilians, voicing concern for the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip. Both leaders gave statements after their meeting. We cannot stand by and watch Palestinians risk starvation. That's not us. That is not what we stand for together. <laughs> Much more humanitarian aid is needed continuously, reliably. I shared my concerns with the Prime Minister that provision of aid from Israel into Gaza and the conditions for distribution must be urgently and massively improved. We believe that the key to peace is security. Many believe that the key to security is peace. But peace is unsustainable without a strong Israel. And if we are offered a peace agreement or a path to peace that makes Israel so weak, and unable to defend itself, and our neighbors still uh, adhering to the goal of destroying the Jewish state, uh, then obviously we will set peace backward and not forward. We want to move peace forward, and for that Israel has to have the necessary security responsibility in this tiny area, otherwise the radical... Shadi Rosanas was following the press conference. Um, hey, Ben. Schultz also pushed for a comprehensive hostage deal. That's important because, I mean, every day that goes by puts their lives at risk. Correct. And that's also the center of attention now in Israel. We know that Hamas gave its answer for uh, the terms that were only negotiated just uh, at the end of last week. Israelis were contemplating over the weekend what should be their response. And um, the head of the Mossad, the Israeli spy agency, is expected to travel to Doha, the capital of Qatar, tomorrow to further go on with the, with the negotiations. Though there are still major uh, contention points between the two sides. We need to be very cautious about any signs of optimism because Hamas still very much is against uh, uh, 
any any demand of Israel to to to, to stop. Uh, they insist that Hamas insists that uh, Gazans can go back to the the northern part of the Strip. Israel is very much against it, and that's a very big point in what's the future for the Gaza Strip and where, for these negotiations. And it's, it is correct very much. The lives of those hostages are, are in jeopardy every day. Um, it's getting, you know, we hear more and more of them that are being, are being pronounced dead by the Israeli military. At the same time, it sounds like there's no stopping the Rafah offensive. Correct, because Israel feels that's the only ace it has up its sleeve. It's back to a wall. Uh, the humanitarian uh, situation is so dire and the international pressure is such that, um, you know, Americans, Germany is itself also started delivering aid themselves to the Gaza Strip. So Israel does not have that card that it's been using for months. So what else does it have? They feel like they have to keep on pushing on Rafah, or at least seem to be willing to push into Rafah in order to get Hamas to budge a little bit when it comes to some uh, making some, uh, you know, some uh, compromise on the deal. And, and that's also, let's not remember, forget the idea of the hostages and bringing them home is a core issue when it comes to Israeli policy, when it comes to the Israeli mindset, the mm. public, the Israeli public, that's a sore, open wound that keeps bleeding every day. And Netanyahu knows he needs to solve that problem. Predictably, Schultz brought up a two-state solution, the reaction. Well, Netanyahu doesn't like the word, the common, the, the, hear this word combination together. Uh, he he doesn't like to hear it from Schultz. He doesn't like to hear it from the Americans. Uh, and this is partially part of the criticism that he's getting from the international community, but also slowly growing in criticism from within on what is the plan? What is the political long-term plan? What's the strategic goal for the end of what we're seeing? Because we're approaching over almost, you know, uh, five and a half months almost in this uh, terrible war. And there's no seem, doesn't seem to be any end in sight. The, the goal of elimination of Hamas is also far from being reached. Um, so if you don't want to bring in the Palestinian Authority, which is also something that Charles clearly uh, said, you know, the need for a reformed Palestinian Authority that will have Gaza and the West Bank is the only way out. And Netanyahu is not willing to even discuss that. And this is exactly what we're seeing now, the, the growing tension between Netanyahu and the rest of the world on the plan for the day after and who's taking over. Uh, the chaos that we're seeing uh, in the Gaza Strip is something that it's very clear is not sustainable. Shani Rosanas, our Middle East analyst, thank you very much for coming You're welcome in. back. I look now at some of the other stories making news. Leaders from the European Union and Egypt have signed a deal to boost ties. About seven and a half billion euros goes to Egypt for stemming the irregular flow of migrants and increasing sales of energy to Europe. The deal is part of EU efforts to move further away from reliance on Russian natural gas. Hundreds of farmers have driven their tractors into central Madrid to protest against agricultural policies. They're demanding better European laws that protect farmers from the rising costs of production and help them receive fair prices for their goods. Similar protests have been held in Spain and other European countries. Latin America is dealing with its worst outbreak of dengue since records began. The virus is transmitted by mosquitoes. Brazil is one of the worst hit countries. According to public health data, over a million Brazilians were infected in January and February. At least 300 people have died. It's hoped these fish can help stop dengue being spread by infected mosquitoes. They're being released into a pool filled with rainwater in Rio de Janeiro. It's the perfect breeding ground for the insects, but the fish eat the mosquito larvae. The fish will multiply and stop the mosquitoes hatching. We will have a lot of fish and few mosquitoes. The fish don't harm anyone. As cases of dengue soar in Brazil, officials are trying to target the sites where mosquitoes lay their eggs. They have also ramped up testing capacities and opened specialized health centers to deal with the surge in infections, which can cause high fever and severe pain. My head aches. My eyes and my entire body hurt. I feel sick. When I eat, I have to vomit, even when I drink water. Authorities say the outbreak is being fueled by rising global temperatures and increased rainfall brought by the El Nino weather phenomenon. In Rio, we have one severe case every day that leads to hospitalization. Brazil has launched a vaccination campaign. But because of supply shortages, it's only being given to children aged under 12. 
Up next, our sports show meets India's ultramarathon mum, who provides for her family while also training and competing. I'm Ben Fazula. Stay with us.